Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here at this uh, incredibly important forum uh, that looks at uh, the role of journalism in the world that we live in today. And I'm absolutely honoured to be here amongst so many of you, so many young journalists, the, the future of our industry. And more than ever, we need our craft. We need this business. When uh, so much is being questioned about the truth, uh, when we see the phenomenon of things like fake news emerging, when our craft is being questioned on a daily basis, uh, it's so important that journalists like yourselves, that our industry remains strong, uh, that uh, the truth prevails, and, and our own responsibility as journalists remains at the forefront of absolutely everything that we do. As mentioned, I'm a anchor for BBC World News. I present a daily news program, so we have discussions about the issues uh, that are happening on the day, uh, and also we have discussions about uh, social issues as well. Um, so uh, I'm, in the last couple of years, have been looking at the rise of uh, global terrorism and, and migration and the impact of conflict, uh, specifically, um, uh, from the Middle East, uh, the subcontinent, and, and North Africa. Uh, so we have a lot of discussions about what lures young people to travel to places like Iraq uh, and Syria, to go there and, and uh, then to return uh, and inflict so much um, hate and, and, and anger and destruction on, on the countries of their birth. So you, just this week, you would have seen the Manchester attack where 22 young lives were lost at the Ariana Grande concert. Uh, so I've been looking at what the, the reasoning behind all of this is. In June of 2014, I was sitting in my living room in, in London watching the television, and I watched this very brutal, dark regime sweep across northern Iraq and arrive in Mosul, Mosul is Iraq's second city, and uh, this was a place that I have a very close affinity to. So it was only a year and a half earlier that I had traveled to Mosul uh, and met a group of paragliders. And, you know, it, Mosul was already one of the most dangerous cities in the world, so I couldn't understand why these these paragliders, the Arab world's oldest paragliding club, wanted to jump off the side of cliffs. So I went there to find out more about these paragliders. And they were the Arab world's oldest paragliding club. And uh, I built a reputation, uh, I built a relationship with them. Uh, one was uh, a Christian woman in her 50s. Uh, another was a uh, Shia woman who was uh, in her early 40s and she was a divorcee. Uh, Yassin, uh, who was 18 at the time, and his father, Captain Saba, who ran the paragliding club. And so I, I built a relationship, as we do, as you all know as journalists, when we go out into the field, when we meet different people, after a while they, they become almost your friends. You know, you, you enter their lives, you, they let you into their homes, and that is a huge privilege, and we mustn't ever forget what a huge privilege that is. When sometimes people ask to interview me I, and talk about my personal story, for example, I find it very confronting. So when I enter people's homes and they tell me about their lives, I feel incredibly privileged. So if you fast forward then from 2013, January, when I was there with the paragliders, and then in 2014, when I sat in my living room and I watched their beloved Mosul being taken over by what was then an unknown force that had described themselves as the so-called Islamic State, ISIS. And they arrived with, with the, these dark clothes and, and these, these dark black flags, proclaiming that they had come to liberate the people of Mosul. And Mosul uh, had for some time uh, been very unstable. Um, the, the Shia, predominantly Shia government in Baghdad uh, had a hand and control over the predominantly Sunni Mosul. So a lot of the young people there felt very oppressed. And so I immediately, the immediate reaction that I had is I need to go there. I need to be there. I need to find out what happened to Yassine, Captain Seba, Dr. Nawal, the, the Christian woman in her 50s, who was one of the Arab world's oldest paragliders uh, and, a, and a woman 
and, and, and Rada, 42-year-old Rada, who said to me that she had taken up flying because it had given her freedom, a reason to live again. So I jumped on a plane and I turned up in northern Iraq in, in Erbil. And at the time, I, I didn't know where, where my friends were now. I didn't know what had happened to them, uh, whether they had stayed in Mosul, whether they had fled the city. But the stories that we were hearing about were of the Yazidi communities in Mount Sinjar. The women were being taken and separated from the men. We were hearing brutal stories of, of them being raped, uh, tortured, sold in the marketplaces for, for $500, $600 uh, as sex slaves. Uh, and then being taken out of Mosul and, and sent to Raqqa in, in Syria. So I wanted to know more about this story. So we, we got into our convoys and traveled from Erbil to Dohuk, where I was told that somewhere between 15 and 20,000 internally displaced people uh, were now living. And I arrived in this camp and I began to do my live reporting back to uh, the BBC in London and it was being streamed across the world on BBC World News for 18 hour days and it was about 45 degrees in, in Dohuk, extremely hot and we were hearing more and more stories of, of the abuse and brutality that people were experiencing under the uh, ISIS um, regime. They pushed a lot of the Yazidis out, they pushed the Christian minorities out of their communities and these are communities that had lived alongside um, Muslims, the Sunnis, the Shias, the Yazidis and the Christians had lived together in one community for thousands of years. Suddenly they were being asked to leave their homes. Their women were being separated and brutalized. And so as I was standing there, this little boy, he was about 12 years old, came to me and said, there's been a massacre. And we weren't sure what he meant. He said, there were 86 people, they've been killed. Uh, and it happened just on the outskirts of, of Sinjar. So I sent my local uh, producer to find out because they said, that there'd been one person who had survived and he may be in a hospital in Dohuk. So my local producer went and he found out that yes, in fact, there was one person and, and we would be the first people to interview him. So I turned up at the hospital uh, in Dohuk and I found grown men, soldiers, weeping, wounded, uh, afraid. Uh, you know, these, some of these were, were young men, 22, 23, 24 years old, forced to go uh, to fight a, a very brutal enemy who wasn't afraid to die. Uh, the ISIS fighters were not afraid to die and they were up against uh, these young men who, who wanted to defend their land and, and wanted uh, to, to rescue a lot of the people who, who were being brutalized in, in Sinjar. And so there in the hospital bed, I found 36-year-old Muhammad. And I asked Muhammad what had happened to him. He was lying in the hospital bed with five bullet wounds. And he, he told me the story of what happened. He said, the ISIS fighters came to our village in the dead of night and they rounded us all up. And they told us to convert or die. And he said, we decided as a community that we would do whatever it took. Whatever they wanted, we would do because we didn't want to, to die. And so we held meetings with the, with the ISIS commanders who came to the village. We gave them our mobile phones, our jewelry, all our possessions, and we said, you can take our homes, but please allow us to, to leave our community to find some safety. And they assured them that they wouldn't kill anyone. And he said, so for a week, Every, every day and every night we were hearing sermons, we were hearing their, them talking and each night we would huddle in different homes and, and we would discuss what would happen to us. Would they kill us? Would they, would they allow us to live? Then he said one morning we got up and the ISIS fighters separated the men from the women and the children. They brought 10 pickup trucks, white trucks, and he said they put 86 of the men into these trucks and he said they took us to a field and he said they lined us all up and Muhammad said I was in the very back row and then he said they began to shoot and they just began to continue to shoot these men and they began to fall to the ground like cattle and he said I, I was shot but I was alive and I played dead, I pretended I was dead and I hid under the bodies. 
And he said they would go around and if anyone moved, they would shoot them point blank range in the face. And Muhammad says he doesn't know how much time passed, it might have been four or five hours that he was lying there under these dead bodies. And then he said everything went silent and then these tractors arrived and the tractors picked up the dead bodies and dumped them into a creek. And Muhammad was amongst these bodies, lying there, playing dead, five bullet wounds, waiting for these men to leave. And he said, I don't know, I don't know how much time passed, but I was lying in this creek. And then he said, some, some time later, when everything went silent, I emerged from the bodies, and he said, I ran. And he said, I didn't know where I was running, but I was going to run, and I was going to get out of there. And that's when he um, arrived to the next closest village, and they brought him to the Dohuk Hospital, the sole survivor of a massacre. And I asked Muhammad who else was in his family, and he said, my mother and my father, my wife, my three-year-old daughter. And I said, well, what's happened to them? And he said, I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever see them again. And, you know, I, I listen to these stories, and, and I sort of think about when the refugee crisis happened across Europe, and we had almost a million or more people arrive on European shores, and, and people say, why or how can people bring their children, cross the ocean, put them in such danger and, and try and seek a different life? And I suppose when I hear these stories, I can say, well, I understand why they do that. I can understand. And part of the reason I can also understand is because of my own personal story. So a lot of, of the stories that I do, I, I think that it has a lot to do with, with my own background. So. I was born in Kabul in Afghanistan. I was six months old when my family fled the country uh, on horseback into Pakistan. They were fleeing the Soviet invasion at the time and my father had been conscripted into the army twice and they didn't want to stay in the country and my father had actually spent seven years uh, studying in what was Czechoslovakia at the time. He returned to a country that was at war. So they left and so I've always had a strong sense of justice, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, you know, world affairs, and, and I've, this has always been a part of, of my life. And so that's why I, I go to these places and I, and I do what I do. Um, if we go back to the theme of not taking no for an answer, and, and in my introduction, they mentioned one of the stories that I did in Afghanistan. Uh, 16 Afghan civilians were, were killed uh, in a village uh, just on the outskirts of Kandahar uh, by an American soldier. And the whole area was completely shut down by the American military and the soldier was taken back to Seattle, uh, taken from the crime scene immediately. He had left the base in the dead of night and gone to this village, shot dead uh, this family of 16 and then burnt their bodies and left them there. The Taliban had promised that anyone who comes to the village will be killed. The Americans said that no one can come to the crime scene because we're still investigating and they'd taken all the witnesses away. And I watched this story and about five weeks earlier I had interviewed the Afghan president, Hamid Karzai, and he had told me about Afghan sovereignty and this was a nation that, was still, that wanted to be sovereign, that didn't want to be uh, controlled by an external power. So I contacted his office and, and I said, this is what he said, I'd like to go to the crime scene and I'd like the help of the president's office to do it. So I arrived in Kabul and then I flew uh, to Kandahar. My cameraman said to me, you know, I have four kids, I don't want to die. And, and you have to constantly think about your teams on the ground. You know, the, you're walking into um, a very dangerous environment and you have to think about your local producer. Without them, without the local teams that you work with, you cannot do anything. I can't go to Mosul, I can't go to Afghanistan, I can't go into uh, Egypt or Libya or, or South Sudan and do anything without the help of, of local producers. And I always place a lot of importance and value on them because we leave, we have foreign passports, we can get out, but what happens to them?
And each year you hear about thousands of journalists who are attacked, who are persecuted, who are imprisoned, uh, who are killed. Uh, and so, you know, it's at the forefront of my mind, their security, their safety. And, and my local producer said to me, I'm from this country as well, I'd, I don't want to get into too much trouble. So you have to think about all of these things at the same time. Equally, it's important to get to the heart of the story, to investigate that particular story. I was told that the area between getting to the crime scene and where I was, was littered with mines, that it was a minefield. And so the president's office asked for the minefield to be cleared so that we could pass. And so a, a number of soldiers, American soldiers, Afghan soldiers, um, escorted me on the orders of the president to the area. And then they stood back and sent me with two policemen and said, we cannot go any further because the Taliban have threatened us. They said they will kill any soldier or anyone entering the crime scene. And so me, my cameraman, my local producer, and two policemen walked into this field. And suddenly, I mean, I can understand the local language, so I could hear them saying, we haven't actually cleared the whole area of mines. So we had to stop, and, and I, I told my cameraman and, and my producer, to everybody form one line, because we just follow the footsteps of the, soldier, uh, the two policemen. We entered the crime scene, and, and we filmed uh, the area, and the story became um, a, a global exclusive. The State Department was forced to respond. The, the, uh, the lawyer of, of, of the um, US uh, soldier, Staff Sergeant Bales, uh, was forced to respond. And it really goes back to not taking no for an answer. Uh, in what we do, uh, you know, you find ways to tell the story, but you also make sure that, you know, you're not taking unnecessary risks. So when I think about that story, there was probably a number of risks that I took uh, that, that perhaps I shouldn't have. Uh, so, you know, as young journalists, you want to rush to a scene, you want to rush to get, be the first to tell that story and, and, and investigate it. But actually, the most important thing is that your safety, the security and safety of you and your teams before you go out uh, and do this. I, I often go to uh, Kabul still today and I, and I meet so many young journalists there, just like yourselves, uh, who are trying to get to the heart of a story, who are trying to find uh, the truth. Um, and uh, I, I, I also think, I wonder if my family hadn't fled the country, if I had stayed in Afghanistan, would I be uh, one of those young women in, in very difficult circumstances? They work and they try um, and, and tell the stories that, that they can. Last year I was uh, in Kabul and uh, I did a story on a network called Tolo TV. And Tolo TV hires a lot of young journalists and they were threatened again by the Taliban um, for a story that they had done. And uh, the Taliban rammed a suicide bombing bus um, into their bus and killed seven of their colleagues and 20 others were injured. And so you realize actually the difficulties and the challenges that local journalists, that young journalists across the world uh, face. So I suppose if there's any words of inspiration that, that I can give you, uh, I would say to always think about your safety and security, but always pursue the truth. Because more than ever, our, our uh, craft is required in, in an environment where we're constantly being questioned, where we're constantly being pressured by, by governments. Don't take no for an answer. There's always a way to get to the heart of the, the story. Thank you. Um, thank you, Yalda, for this great speech. And now it's time for questions from the audience. So this guy was the first. You're welcome. Uh, Ostap Yorich, School of Journalism at Coombe. Uh, I have the question about the, uh, the migration crisis in the, Euro in the EU and radical moods. Like because of the migration crisis, Europe now faces with the rising of radical moods. Sometimes people are just afraid. Sometimes they're like far radical far right movements like neo Nazis and that's it. My question is about how we journalists have to cover the position of those people who, who are against migration, who are radical. Do we have to cover that and how we should do that? Of course. You have to get all sides of the story. It's incredibly important not to 
be so caught up in, you know, if, if, if they're not your views or if you don't share their views as a journalist, the most important thing is always remain impartial. You have to hear out why they feel this way. You have to show the other side of the story. Um, and so the best way to do it is to embed with these groups. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to go to Hungary in a few weeks to look at an alt-right um, uh, group and, and find out why, for example, they've got vigilante groups on the border pushing refugees back, uh, you know, beating them up to get them out of their country and back onto the other side of the border. It's incredibly important to cover these stories from all angles. Uh, and, and whether you do it online or whether you do it for radio or television, you have to show both sides of the story. And that's something that the BBC really prides itself on. You cannot say, well, you know, this is a bad group because they don't follow, they don't, you know, accept refugees or, or you know, I don't, I don't believe in their views. That's not our job as journalists to, in, to enforce our views on, on the audience. Our job as journalists is to give a wide range uh, of views for them and then they decide, uh, you know, what their views are based on our work, based on our investigation, based on our research. So it's absolutely crucial to show all sides of any report that you do. Um, with the uh, story that I did in the mine f uh, in uh, Afghanistan that I mentioned with the 16 Afghan civilians who were killed, we had to get a response from the American military. We had to get a response from the Afghan government. We had to get a response from uh, the the lawyer of, of of the of the man. Even if they don't respond, you have to incorporate that in your report. You have to say so that you can show that you were fair to all sides. So it's incredibly important to cover those stories, especially now when there is this wave of alt-right groups across Europe, this, this concern about migration. So I did a story in Sweden, for example, uh, on, on jihadis. Uh, but I also looked at the, the rising number of people who don't want immigrants uh, in, in their country. So you have to show both sides at all times. It's very important. So the question is, um, there are a lot of Europeans who, uh, who uh, join some terroristic organizations. So why, uh, like local people who are not refugees, um, what do you think about this situation? And uh, uh, do you do investigations about this kind of uh, cooperation with terroristic organizations? Absolutely. I, I just mentioned my story there most recently from Sweden. So Sweden in Europe per capita is the second highest um, the country that, send, that most people go to Iraq and, and Syria to fight. So last year I did an investigation on, on the number of people. They don't know what the exact number is. It's anywhere between 300 and 350 people who have left Sweden to go to Syria and, and Iraq. Many of them are second, first generation. They were born in Swedish hospitals. They, they haven't come from the wave of, of refugees or migrants from the last few years. A lot of them, their, their parents were born in Sweden or their parents have come from another country and they were born uh, in Sweden. So it's become a huge huge problem and, and I think it's, it's twofold. It's also the fact that these young people feel disenfranchised, they feel removed from society, they don't feel they belong. A lot of them uh, drop out of school at the age of 14, 13. The, the rate in um, Angered, the town that I had gone to, uh, of immigrants living there is 75%. 75% of people in Angered come from uh, non-Swedish background. Of that, something like 60% of young people there drop out of school by the time they're 13 or 14. Then they fall prey to these, uh, you know, extremists who lure them in and say, Swedish society is against you, the Western world is against you, look at these images of the war in Iraq, in Syria. I met a young girl who traveled with her husband and her two-year-old son and one-year-old daughter to Syria and lived in, in Raqqa. Her husband was killed in an airstrike. Her child was killed in an airstrike. She was then forced to uh, marry another ISIS fighter. She managed to flee the country. Um, on the way, though, she was uh, gang-raped by the Al-Nusra Front. Then she was handed to the um, uh, Syrian um, uh, military. Two of the Syrian soldiers raped her, 
She then took her child, who was covered in shrapnel, across the border into Turkey and back to Sweden. She's 22 years old. You know, and her life is virtually over. She's suffering from so many uh, psychological problems. She's just one example of, of, you know, so many dozens of young girls, young boys who leave uh, their homes in, in, in different parts of Europe. We've seen it in Belgium, we've seen it in France, we've just seen it now in Britain. It's a huge phenomenon. The numbers are dropping. As, as, as the, the, the issue is dealt with in, in, in um, Iraq and in Syria. Um, but it remains a huge problem and, and governments need to look at why this is happening. What's going on in these communities? It's so important for them not to become ghettos. So, so it, Ungered has almost become like a ghetto where they're on the outskirts of society. They're not part of mainstream Swedish society. They, you know, a lot of them don't even have Swedish native, native friends, for example. These young people say to me, I don't feel Swedish. I don't feel like I belong in this country. There's a lot of anger and, and resentment that comes out of that. Uh, but still, I can't understand the position of European governors, you see, because uh, a lot of refugees... <laughs> And what else? Yeah. What is their real reaction? Because uh, we are looking for some slow bomb in Europe. Indeed. It's like, a, it's like a ticking time bomb. You know, we're seeing this happen and, and it's not properly being addressed at the grassroots level. Yes, there are different groups trying to deal with these issues. In Sweden, for example, it's very strange. They don't even have a proper database of the number of people who are going to Syria and coming back to the country. They're not even keeping a track of it, you know? And so this is also worrying because you think, what are these people actually thinking when they come back to the country? What, what, what's going through their minds? What are they planning? What sort of uh, devastation could, could hit Swedish towns or cities? Because, uh, you know, I confronted the police chief, for example, and said this is negligence on your part for not keeping a tab or not being fully aware of what's being preached to them in these mosques. And it's not, I don't think it's just about the mosques and the religious elders and, and these young people, but it's, it's twofold. It has to come from the governments as well to see why is there a lack of assimilation? Why do these young people feel they don't belong? And I don't think we've seen the end of it, actually. This problem is not resolved, it's far from it. Yeah. It's interesting because as the BBC, um, we can give analysis, uh, but we don't give opinion. You know, on, we, so we present the investigation to the audience. We say, this is what we've seen in eastern Ukraine. This is what we understand is happening. Uh, we gather the information, we present it to the audience. In terms of whether we have an opinion on what is happening or what they're doing, we cannot. You know, that is the way that we report. Everything is almost um, on the border. So we say, this is what this side is saying and doing. This is what's happening on this side. This is the number of deaths as a result of the ongoing war. This is the policy of each of the governments. But giving an opinion and saying, I think that group is a terrorist group, unless they're a prescribed terrorist group, you know, by an international body. We are also very funny about the term terrorism. Uh, it's, it's, you know, in terms of when we label them or when we describe someone as a, as a terrorist. So, in terms of the way that we do journalism at the BBC, we show both sides. Um, we, we, we give... Can you put it off? Oh, sure. It's, it's interfering. <laughs> we can hear all the translation. Um, so... In terms of criticism, do you mean that um, journalists who come on air and start giving their own opinion and describing certain groups as terrorists, do you mean that, do you? Is that what you mean? Ukrainian journalists who get on television and describe the various groups as terrorists? Is that, is that what your question is? We are, very, we are very careful about that at the BBC to, um, you know, we give the both sides, we, we, we describe what's happening, um, but we don't give our opinion uh, on the situation. So even in Manchester, for example, we gave details of, of who this man was, but we don't say, I think he did this, or I think he's a terrorist, if you know what I mean. <laughs> 
Impartiality is, is core to everything that the BBC does. Okay, so we have one last question for now, and uh, well, but I see that uh, Michael Boturkin has reserved it, so <laughs> okay. I'm giving a mic to him. Um, thank you for the great presentation. I always wonder, uh, journalists of your stature and your experience, is there a point where after you left Afghanistan and all of a sudden you said, I want to be a journalist or I need to be a journalist, what was kind of that spark or that influence that led to where you are today? Uh, you know, I, I often say that I, I wanted to, do, to be a journalist since I was about seven years old. And I think, again, that has a lot to do with my personal background, my story. Um, the fact that issues of social justice, world affairs, the news was constantly discussed in my household uh, is what drew me uh, to this. My, my mother often says, we took you out of a war zone, why do you want to go back? Um, and so, you know, I have to tell her that actually, um, if I don't give voice to people who don't have a voice or a platform, it's not always the most sexy story in the world to go to South Sudan, to live in a tent for, for 10 days w without proper running water, without proper food, uh, to better understand uh, you know, the, the civil war there and the atrocities that people face. But actually, those stories need to be told uh, because in an age where we um, have shorter attention spans and we want everything immediately, um, I, there are still so many conflicts, so many issues that people face around the world that aren't being heard. So if that means that one person or two people react to a story that I do and start to question why we have certain policies, then I feel like perhaps I've done my job. Thank you. Друзі, це була Ялда Хаким. Ялда, дякую дуже.